The children who came along the beach, singly or in twos, leapt into visibility when they crossed the line from the heat haze to the nearer sand. Here, the eye was first attracted to a black bat-like creature that danced on the sand, only later perceived the body above it. The bat was the child's shadow, shrunk by the vertical sun to a patch between hurrying feet. Even while he blew, Ralph noticed the last pair of bodies that reached the platform above the fluttering patch of black. The two boys, bullet-headed with hair like tow, flung themselves down and lay grinning and panting at Ralph like dogs. They were twins, and the eye was shocked and incredulous at such cheery duplication. They breathed together, they grinned together, they were chunky and vital. They raised wet lips at Ralph, for they seemed provided with not quite enough skin, so that their profiles were blurred and their mouths pulled open. Piggy bent his flashing glasses to them and could be heard between the blasts repeating their names. Sam, Eric, Sam, Eric. Then he got muddled. The twins shook their heads and pointed at each other and the crowd laughed. At last, Ralph ceased to blow and sat there, the conch trailing from, his, trailing from one hand. His head bowed on his knees. As the echoes died away, so did the laughter, and there was silence. Within the diamond haze of the beach, something dark was fumbling along. Ralph saw it first and watched till the intentness of his gaze drew all eyes that way. Then the creature stepped from mirage onto clear sand, and they saw that the darkness was not all shadow, but mostly clothing. The creature was a party of boys marching approximately in step in two parallel lines and dressed in strangely eccentric clothing. Shorts, shirts, and different garments they carried in their hands, but each boy wore a square black cap with a silver badge on it. Their bodies from throat to ankle were hidden by black cloaks which bore a long silver cross on the left breast and each neck was finished off with a ham bone frill. The heat of the tropics, the descent, the search for food, and now this sweaty march along the blazing beach had given them the complexions of newly washed plums. The boy who controlled them was dressed in the same way, though his cap badge was golden. When his party was about 10 yards from the platform, he shouted an order and they halted, gasping, sweating, swaying in the fierce light. The boy himself came forward, vaulted onto the platform with his cloak flying, and peered into what, to him, was almost complete darkness. Where's the man with the trumpet? Ralph, sensing his sun blindness, answered him. There's no man with a trumpet, only me. The boy came close and peered down at Ralph, screwing up his face as he did so. What he saw of the fair-haired boy with the creamy shell on his knees did not seem to satisfy him. He turned quickly, his black cloak swirling. Isn't there a ship then? Inside the floating cloak, he was tall, thin, and bony. His hair was red beneath the black cap. His face was crumpled and freckled and ugly without silliness. Out of this face stared two light blue eyes, frustrated now and turning or ready to turn to anger. A lot of indirect characterization of this boy now as well. Okay, we know he is the boss of the group that just came in. He shouts orders to them. He's already frustrated. He's ready to anger. There's a lot of underlying violence here. So the connotations of this character are pretty negative already. Isn't there a man here? Ralph spoke to his back. No, we're having a meeting. Come and join in. The group of cloaked boys began to scatter from close line. The tall boy shouted at them, choir, stand still. Wearily obedient, the choir huddled into line and stood there swaying in the sun. Nonetheless, some began protesting faintly. But Meridu, please Meridu, can't we? Then one of the boys flopped on his face in the sand and the line broke up. They heaved the fallen boy to the platform and let him lie. Meridu, his eyes staring, made the best of a bad job. Okay, so here we have the boy Meridu. He goes by his last name like an adult, and he also insists that the boys stay in formation until one boy passes out. So he's very strict and authoritarian here. Okay. All right, then sit down, let him alone. But Meridu, 
He's always throwing a feint, said Merido. Do he did in jib and a dece and at matins over the precentor. The last piece of shop brought sniggers from the choir, who perched like blackbirds on the crisscrossed trunks and examined Ralph with interest. Piggy asked no names. He was intimidated by this uniformed superiority and the offhand authority in Meridu's voice. He shrank to the other side of Ralph and busied himself with his glasses. Meridu turned to Ralph. Aren't there any grown-ups? No. Meridu sat down on a trunk and looked around the circle. Then we'll have to look after ourselves. Secure on the other side of Ralph, Piggy smoke, spoke timidly. That's why Ralph made a meeting, so as we can decide what to do. We've heard names, that's Johnny, those two, they're twins, Sam and Eric. Which is Eric? You know you're Sam, I'm Sam, and I'm Eric. We'd better have all the names, said Ralph, so I'm Ralph. We got most names, said Piggy, got them just now. Kids' names, said Meridu. Why should I be Jack? I'm Meridu. Again, showing his authority. The names here are really important. Okay, we're going to see names throughout play a big deal. It connects strongly to identity. Okay, think of the different names you may go by in different social circles. What does your grandmother call you? What does your coaches call you? Your friends? Any online usernames? We use names as part of ide our identity and we shift them kind of depending on which persona we're presenting at that time. Okay, so here we have Jack wants to present an authoritative persona, so he wants to go by his last name, Meridu, not by his first name like kids do. Okay. Ralph turned to him quickly. This was the voice of one who knew his own mind. Then went on Piggy, that boy, I forget. You're talking too much, said Jack Meridu. Shut up, fatty. Laughter arose. He's not fatty, cried Ralph. His real name's Piggy. Piggy! Piggy! Oh, Piggy! A storm of laughter arose, and even the tiniest child joined in. For a moment, the boys were a closed circuit of sympathy with Piggy outside. He went very pink, bowed his head, and cleaned his glasses again. Finally, the laughter died away, and the naming continued. There was Maurice, next in size among the choir boys to Jack, but broad and grinning all the time. There was a slight furtive boy whom no one knew who he kept to himself with an inner intensity of avoidance and secrecy. He muttered that his name was Roger and he was silent again. Bill, Robert, Harold, Henry, the choir boy who had fainted sat up against a palm trunk and smiled pallidly at Ralph and Jack and said his name was Simon. Jack spoke, we've got to decide about being rescued. There was a buzz. One of the small boys, Henry, said that he wanted to go home. Shut up, said Ralph absently. He lifted the conch. Seems to me we ought to have a chief to decide things. A chief, a chief. I ought to be chief, said Jack with simple arrogance, because I'm the chapter chorister and head boy. I can sing C sharp. Another buzz. Well then, said Jack, I, he hesitated. The dark boy, Roger, stirred at last and spoke up. Let's have a vote. Yes, vote for chief, let's vote. This toy of voting was almost as pleasing as the conch. Jack started to protest, but the clamor changed from the general wish for a chief to an election by acclaim of Ralph himself. None of the boys could have found good reason for this. What intelligence had been shown was traceable to Piggy, while the most obvious leader was Jack. Okay, here, I, I like this expression, the toy of voting. It's an interesting metaphor because so far it's all kind of like a big game to the boys. They're stranded on a desert island, but there are no adults. And so it's kind of like they're playing and it's all a big adventure. And so now they are playing with this toy idea of voting. Um, everything is leaning towards Ralph being the leader, even though there's no good reason for Ralph to be the leader. All of the intelligence and logic has gone back to Piggy and the one with the most authority and the strictest kind of grown-up demeanor is Jack. So we're going to see how their election goes. Okay? But there was a stillness about Ralph as he sat that marked him out. There was his size, an attractive appearance, and most obscurely, most powerfully, there was the conch. That being that had blown that, had sat waiting for them on the platform with the delicate thing balanced on his knees, was set apart. Again, so the conch is one of our important symbols. 
and we're going to see that that is the symbol of power and leadership. And because Ralph has the conch, he's going to be elected as their leader. Him with the shell. Ralph, Ralph, let him be the chief with the trumpet thing. Ralph raised his hand for silence. All right, who wants Jack for chief? With a dreary obedience, the choir raised their hands. Who wants me? Every hand outside the choir, except Piggy's, was raised immediately. Then Piggy, too, raised his hand grudgingly into the air. Ralph counted. I'm chief, then. The circle of boys broke into applause. Even the choir applauded, and the freckles on Jack's face disappeared under a blush of mortification. He started up, then changed his mind, and sat down again while the air, air rang. Ralph looked at him, eager to offer something. The choir belongs to you, of course. They could be the army. Or hunters, they could be... The suffusion drained away from Jack's face. Ralph waved again for silence. Jack's in charge of the choir. They can be... What do you want them to be? Hunters. Jack and Ralph smiled at each other with shy liking. The rest began to talk eagerly. Jack stood up. All right, choir, take off your togs. As if released from class, the boys stood up, chattered, piled their black cloaks on the grass. Jack laid his on the trunk by Ralph. His gray shorts were sticking to him with sweat. Ralph glanced at them admiringly, and when Jack saw his glance, he explained, I tried to get over the hill to see if there was water all around, but your shell called us. Ralph smiled and held up the conch for silence. Listen, everybody, I've got to have time to think things out. I can't decide what to do straight off. If this isn't an island, we might be rescued straight away. So we've got to decide if this is an island. Everybody must stay around here and wait and not go away. Three of us, if we take more, we'll get all mixed and lose each other. Three of us will go on an expedition to find out. I'll go and Jack and, and he looked around the eager faces. <laughs>